Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the talk, Planes, Games and Automobiles. Uh, glad you guys have made it. Just out of curiosity before we begin, who here is currently working in game development within the enterprise space? And by that, I mean working with clients that uh, is essentially not the entertainment industry. Okay. That's cool. Not too many. Well, that's good because I guess this talk is to try to inspire different ways of thinking. So that's great. Um, okay. So who are we? This is a picture of me and Liam uh, with our first collaboration looking very young and unstressed. Uh, so my name's Jack Condon and I'm a real-time developer. I currently lead the real-time team at S1T2. Uh, I've not always been a real-time developer, however. Uh, the majority of my career I've had a double life as a practicing artist working with uh, sculpture and photo media. Um, for a long time, game development for me ran sort of mutually exclusive to my other interests or in parallel. Uh, but it wasn't until about like four years ago that I started to blend my fine art practice with real time. And that got me really excited because I started to see all this potential for real time to actually merge with other disciplines and build really incredible, beautiful things. Um, so that's essentially what's led me here today. Uh, within game development, I enjoy game design, uh, lighting, obviously with my photo media background, that makes sense. Uh, VFX, tech art, as well as code architecture and logic of code. And uh, I'm Liam, so I call myself a creative technologist, which basically means I work on all the experiential stuff, um, that's anything physical that the public can interact with, so it's anything from lighting installations to connect based activations and that kind of jazz, and I also give Jack a hand in real time. Uh, I used to be a web developer when I first started my career, and I've slowly sort of transitioned into this role, um, and I studied fine arts as well. So. Now, my role, I really get to fuse my love of technical development with art and make some really cool things. I'm really into computer vision um, and exploring different ways that people can interact with computers. Uh, and like Jack, I'm really into VFX and tech art, so we often have to fight over who gets to work on the cool stuff. So planes, games, and automobiles. Uh, this is a funny title. Uh, we had a lot of help from Chris Murphy because we couldn't find something. Um, and you know, it was just, he, he came up with this thing, planes, games, and automobiles. And we were like, hang on, we have worked with all those different fields. So we're really lucky with that. But essentially this talk is about uh, talking about game develop, uh, development in fields outside of the entertainment industry. So the whole idea of this talk is to have you guys walk away with the appreciation that working across heaps of different clients and collaborating with different fields outside of entertainment is really a valid form of expression. And more than that, it's incredibly fun. Uh, I guess ideally it's about finding those people in the crowd who probably don't know what it looks like to work uh, in enterprise with game development. Uh, maybe the people who think this type of work will end up having you making banking apps or fintech software and saying, hey, actually, no, it's really cool and we're part of something much, much bigger. Uh, it's a brave new world full of awesome opportunities and it really is really requiring quite unique creative executions. So what we want to show through our machine gun and postmortems is that above all else, it's a space that's incredibly experimental and creatively satisfying. And perhaps we should all think in the game dev industry about diversifying what we're doing and thinking outside the box. Um, so the talk structure, first we're going to be very narcissistic and give you a sort of uh, brief demo of who S1T2 is and why we might do the things that we do. Um, after that, we're going to provide some external case studies uh, that we hope will put this kind of idea into context about real time's ability to shape other industries. Uh, and then we're going to show, share with you our failings, failings and successes, what we've learned about working in the space and um, kind of show you what's really cool about working in this space that's different from working in the entertainment industry and try to show our insights into that. So here comes the, uh, the narcissism. Uh, who is S1T2 and why the strange and funny name? S1T2 is a really tricky company to define. That's why we're trying to go through a rebranding right now and it's a whole drama. Uh, but it's because we do a lot of things. We don't do one thing and it's very hard to define us. We're not just a game development company, but we're also an interactive sculpture company. Uh, we're also a web development company. We work across lighting, we work across sculpture, web, film, embedded systems, and so many other systems. It's an amazing place to work as an individual because you never know where your creative energy can get spread over all these different types of projects. And that's really cool, but it's a bit hard to explain exactly what you do to a client, or even more diabolical, your parents. 
S1T2 stands for story first, technology second, and that's our mantra. We're a creative technology company, which is kind of like a strange term that a lot of people haven't heard, um, but essentially it means that we're technologically agnostic. We try not to work across like one set of technology, but rather everything to solve creative problems um, within other businesses or whatnot. Whether it be, uh, you know, so we try to find the right solution, whether it be a video game, an interactive WebGL experience, or you know, large-scale public sculpture, some of the work that Liam works on. Uh, we're interested in applying these interactive tools to ultimately try to find new ways to share narrative. I guess that comes back to our mantra. And we're interested in this merge of artistic concept and technology and how we might be able to build a new language to better understand the world. It's this constant R&D into technology for the function of art that really defines who we are and why I personally love working there. And I guess our part in this whole thing individually, um, we all know the potential for video games as a narrative form has not even scratched the surface. We all know how powerful that medium is. That's why we're here today. And I guess me and Liam are glad to be a small part in developing that and a small part of that story. So due to the nature of our multifaceted workload, we have an even wider range of skilled people who work with us to explore these awesome ideas. We work with graphics, UX, UI designers, illustrators, front and back end web developers, traditional and 3D artists, technical artists, creative directors, real time developers, business developers, tinkerers and makers, electrical and mechanical engineers, and the list just is continually growing. So everyone who's employed at S1T2 is encouraged to be a generalist, to sort of break outside uh, of what their schooling was scoped for and learn new and interesting things, which will then feed back to their role and make them a powerhouse of creative ideas with the abilities and skill to execute those ideas. Working with all these talented people mean that we all have parallel interests. We have the chance to be more than just a title, to work on more than just serving the entertainment, advertising and B2B industries. We get the opportunity to be artists, to push boundaries and to challenge our idea of what work should be. So this is a list of clients um, and we've had the pleasure of paying and working with clients such as Samsung, the Royal Australian Air Force, HSBC, Adobe, Cathay Pacific, Jaguar, the Fijian government, Ford and Energizer. Although this work does fit into the entertainment, advertising and B2B categories, these clients give us the opportunity uh, to challenge our ideas and our, our ideals. All of our clients want different things, from art style to application, and this is where we get to be really creative. Working this way can be pretty stressful at times, because we have pretty tight deadlines most of the time, um, and there's no time to actually perfect or master any one technique or style. But we take that limitation at face value, because it's taught us to uh, learn and adopt new styles in, in a rapid way, and we've definitely perfected doing that. So, the real-time revolution with a JPEG version of William Wallace, who I am aware didn't fight in a revolution, but rather an independence, but I thought Braveheart was a pretty good film and it's like well shot, so you know, there's Mel Gibson looking spooky, leading the charge. Um, so anyway, right now, even outside of S1T2, the world is going through a real-time revolution. Real-time technology has gotten to the point that business uh, can't ignore its application. I mean, you've got catalysts like VR and AR really pushing this and it's kind of like almost cringy to see that happen. But the truth is it's so much bigger than that. We saw really good examples um, of this at the last State of Unreal talk. I won't dive into it because we're on the Unreal room, but essentially obviously the Rogue One demo and the human, um, what's it called? The human race. Human race, thank you, Unreal devs. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but I think overall, uh, the push for Epic to move into this new landscape is really telling of all the enterprise companies out there really trying to make their mark on the world through tools that you and I know really well. Um, so I wanted to share two of my favorite case studies right now, external from our work, that encapsulate this concept of real time's ability to add value to other disciplines. Uh, I think there's obviously so many good examples and even more coming every day, but the takeaway I want you guys to think about um, when I'm doing this is that game engines are having a profound impact on any industry they collaborate with. Um, whether it be post-production, architecture, training, medical science, whatever. Um, so this is NIST's work. It's a case study. It's a really cool uh, application of a uh, gaming engine. So it's uh, from the National Institute of Standards and Technology in the USA. And they've been working with robots that are designed for search and rescue. So essentially after an earthquake or um, 
maybe a tsunami, natural disaster, things like this, they can get in there and climb over rocks and get in there and save lives, essentially. So what they've set up is a physical simulation that emulates real life environments where they test robot sensors and movement modules to get out of spicy situations. Essentially, it's Gladiators the 90s TV show, but for robots. <laughs> Uh, however, game engines have been doing that for a long time, both Gladiator platform challenges and simulations. Game engine physics and environments have gotten to the point where NIST were able to model these arenas inside of UE4. And if you look closely on the screen with the right, uh, past Gladiators, you'll see that that's not a real environment, but an artistic render, which is actually quite clear. They're scientists, not artists, so give them some slack. <laughs> but they're able to program these virtual sensors and movement modules inside of Unreal Engine and that basically gets them out of the expensive prototyping stage. It's virtual prototyping. And if you apply this same idea that game engines can mirror or simulate um, our own world, then just think about the incredible potential for industry, any industry. And simulation obviously has been around um, for a long time, but all of a sudden it's really obtainable for everyone. And, and more than that, there are experienced staff out there who can put these things together. I'm talking about you guys. Um, this is another really good example. Uh, this is Dr. Uh, Miguel Nicoles, and he's working on brain-machine interfaces to restore mobility, as you can see in his slide, which is captured by my slide, also known as slide inception. Uh, so essentially, his work is um, to deal with people who've lost their ability for movement due to a tragic accident. So the, he uses a combination of robotics and VR, which you can kind of see in this picture, and it allows them to re-establish the neural pathways by using the VR simulation to allow the users to experience movement while the robotics mirror this experience. The result allows mental command to link with the user's movements, thus rebuilding neurological bonds. So it is incredible. Um, this groundbreaking research, we can see, VR can change more than attitudes and ideas. It can change our brains and our bodies affecting us both profoundly physically and psychologically. So our role in this whole thing, um, we aren't making people walk again. It's a pretty hard act to follow in retrospect. <laughs> uh, but we are adding our own unique contribution to this field. And we hope that our experience can give you context about what it's like to have your feet on the ground in this side of game development. We're gonna move pretty fast through our slides um, so everyone can go to lunch, but uh, we wanted to cover essentially four aspects that we think are the coolest things about working within this kind of realm. Um, the first is we're gonna cover using game development to assist research. Similar to those examples that I've just did, but kind of our take on that and what we've learned about working with those institutions. Um, the next, we're gonna reassure you that you will not lose artistic expression if you move into enterprise. This is a common misconception. Um, so I, I will assure you and prove that you will not lose artistic expression. Uh, then we're gonna talk about the ability to work on strange non-existent platforms and human control interfaces, uh, which is uh, something not totally unique to our space, but generally pretty typical. And finally, the concept of free XP, basically the advantages to your personal projects from working in this space, or kind of like moonlighting a bit, but yeah. Um, so first of all, gaming and research. Cool. So uh, not too long ago, UNSW's, which is University of New South Wales, nuclear research department reached out to us and asked us to partner with them on a project in order to rethink the concept of a hot lab, which is an unmanned room where they conduct radioactive experiments. So these hot labs are gigantic chambers made from lead, which is multiple uh, feet thick. Uh, they're shielded radiation containment chambers. Uh, think of it kind of like the box that Homer plays with his little isotopes in, in The Simpsons, but at a much larger scale. So the only way to interact with what's on the inside of these chambers is a few large mechanical arms, which you kind of have to manually, manually drive, kind of like a Tonka truck. And the only way to see what's going on is a two feet thick piece of glass or a really shitty RGB webcam. So essentially, from a technological perspective, what they kind of wanted us to help make was a, a telepresence prototype where you could be virtually present in the room without actually being in there because you would die of radiation poisoning. So the idea was to produce a prototype uh, for this nuclear innovation conference in Fukushima, of all places. Ooh, 
video time. Time to see if this works. Yeah, sorry, we've just got some alt tab action going on. It's not as glamorous as it could be. It's working. Cool. It's VR. It's a bit laggy. So this is at the conference um, in Fukushima. And this is our very uh, scientific instruments. Yep. <laughs> so this is them pretending like they're, they're using a manipulator. And then they can see that data in real, real time so they can kind of look at the scene from outside. I like this bit. There's some innuendo going on. <laughs> Right, so that's that. Let's go back here. So the technical challenges of this project were pretty crazy at face value. Like, how do you digitally map a room in real time? And then how do you then look at that data once it's uh, been pro processed? Over the years, we've done heaps of work using both VR and Xbox Connects, and we knew that both of these technologies could definitely help us achieve telepresence when combined. However, there were a few technical challenges um, that needed to be addressed before we could integrate both of these technologies and reach some sort of functioning prototype. So like our scientist partners, we decided to do some scientitioning. We had a bunch of Kinects and a HTC Vive laying around the office from some old projects, so naturally that was where we first went. And we figured we'd need a couple of Kinects to sort of uh, map a whole hot lab and minimize occlusion caused by whatever strange objects you'd keep in a radioactive chamber. I guess this is where the experimenting came in, uh, because before we even started, we started to encounter problem after problem. We had to use a Mac to plug the connects into because of this really silly Windows limitation where you can only have one connect plugged into a Windows computer. And then we had to figure out how to make some holistic sense of the multiple cameras we had. We pretty much had to figure out how to combine two images that were looking at something from the opposite, like opposite from each other, and then yeah, it was pretty hard. I mean, how do you map someone's head from them taking a selfie in the mirror? So we were lucky because our images had depth data. So we figured that once we'd unpack the images and put them into world space, then we'd just kind of manually tweak them and align them. And the next problem we faced was trying to get these images back to Unreal intact from the little Mac that could. And due to our lack of knowledge in compression, and network bandwidth and all the other stuff I would have learned if I did a computer science degree, what we were sending was just too much for the network to handle. And we had a lot of problems here. After a lot of trial and error, consistent Googling and trolling Stack Overflow, we managed to get a raw grayscale uh, gray depth images streaming back through to Unreal perfectly, which was awesome. So now we're effectively streaming two depth streams back to Unreal and unpacking that data in a way that we could make sense of it. Now we just had to take those little 2D images and turn them into 3D points in, uh, with depth to reflect the real world. Easy. Actually, it was a lot easier than we anticipated due to this transcendent spirit known as Ryan Brox and his handy quad chain vertex workaround, which is basically you create a mesh and then you move all the vertices to where you want them to be and then draw little points on those vertices. So it's pretty much making a particle system that you have full control over the positions of particles. So armed with this, we're now displaying what the connects were seeing in real time, and the rest of the project pretty much pieced itself together. We hacked a solution to align the, the point clouds, and then Unreal makes it super easy to jump into VR and look at your project. So there you had it. We had a minimum viable product, all achieved before the conference. The reception at the conference in Fukushima was incredible. Here you have an industry that hasn't been touched by the real-time revolution yet. They're currently using webcams and glass thicker than Milhouse's glasses to look at their experiments. In a few short weeks of collaborating with some of the brightest minds in this field, we created a way to walk around a room filled with nuclear radiation so scientists can get up close and personal with their experiments. We got to be research partners with a research institution and come up with a solution that could potentially revolutionize this whole industry. And the only way we could achieve that is through cross-industry collaboration. Suppliers and vendors were all amazed by this simple prototype we knocked up. And I have no doubt in the next few years, you'll start to see this kind of thing being rolled out in hot labs across the world. In a way, I guess you could say we're, we're changing up the entire hot lab industry, just like Gordon Freeman did. Uh, so artistic expression, I told you that this is like a point that a lot of people think, you know, will die in enterprise. A lot of you probably think, so you step into enterprise and that's the end of art and hello, boring corporate micromanaging overlords. Um, but actually it is the complete opposite. Uh, a lot of our real-time team has a background in fine arts uh, through education or practice. 
And it's a no-brainer that we're really interested in how real-time can merge with the visual arts. This gets represented a lot in our projects and interests. Like uh, we do, we curate a show called Fables of the Threshold every year, which is a gallery space that brings these ideas to the public. Do want to call out soon, so if you're interested in that kind of thing. Uh, and outside of that, we also get involved in things like Vivid and other light sculptures and things like that. So it's really awesome that um, to be on that kind of bleeding edge when we can be uh, with the procedural art movements and this kind of interactive art. Um, and it's somewhere where we like to live and try to exist. But it also has a really strong crossover with a lot of client interest. This kind of work allows brands to approach us when they perhaps want to share a story in a completely new or innovative way. And because of that relationship dynamic, clients are really hands off. I wanted to share our first automobile job. Uh, now, a lot of you are probably thinking car rendering, that doesn't seem abstract or artistic. Uh, well, it can be quite technical, um, but when the car is literally made out of an intelligent star nebula, it's also a creative exercise, I can assure you. It's worth noting that we've done a lot of work in auto, uh, the auto space. To this day, the focus of a rendered car, we have never done. We've done them in the background, we've done them calling at you, we've done them invisible, like rippling a lake. We've never actually been asked uh, by our collaborators to like be like, here's a car. Uh, and I think that's quite interesting about where the headspace of these industries are. So this is Jaguar, it's actually... Video first. Oh yeah, I'll show you a video. Bit of context. This one's got me in it, so it's... It's a, uh, oh, there we go. So basically what's going on here is that um, I'm feeling, as, as, as I walk through the screen, in screen space, you see me glow, right? So we're using a depth-based camera. And then the stars will respond to that and form the mesh. Um, I explain it better here. So let's, let's just go back there, shall we? <laughs> it's, it's, it's like so bizarre to actually talk about these concepts, you know, like, anyway, Jaguar art, uh, art of performance. I've made a typo up there and done hard of performance, but it doesn't really matter. In the studio, we just call it Jag because it's easier and we haven't worked with Jag again. I don't think that's a thing to do with our work. It's just hasn't happened yet. So it's just Jag and I guess we'll have Jag too. Um, so Jag was displayed over three gigantic screens, huge. It used a camera to capture a depth stream to identify people versus like random shapes or other convention things like cosplayers um, and essentially use that as an input method um, to change the large, uh, large star nebula into a mesh, being obviously a car. Um, so basically, if a user walked past a little star in screen space, it would respond by uh, moving a path to a vertex on the mesh. Um, this meant, however, that each one of our little stars required a little star brain. Uh, and that was super dangerous because it could easily end the project in death by like half a million paper cuts. Uh, right, video there. Thanks. <laughs> it's all right. Uh, a bit of context. <laughs> uh, a bit of context into why JAG might want something like this and why they're an ideal collaborator. Um, car companies are really going out of their way right now to jump onto this experiential advertising thing. And like I said, they're being very creative with it. Basically, traditional advertising is boring and lame, and it can't compete with actual content that gives people an experience that might be meaningful to them. If you summarize it, that's it. They're needing to do this. They have to. We actually stumbled into this project. It was one of those really fun situations where their supplier um, bailed with eight days to the project, had to be completed, and they failed to deliver. So we took the project on um, like chumps with eight days to go, uh, and that includes briefing time, forming a team, pre-production, production of course, client feedback, iteration, deployment in China internationally. Uh, so it was a big undertaking. Uh, we set up a group of tables, like a CIC war room, and we bought a lot of beer and we got stuck in. I like to pretend it was the bridge on Battlestar Galactica, but it was probably more like a technomancer scene from Ghost in the Shell with wires just everywhere. Um, we ran two or three different approaches at once. We knew we didn't have time to iterate. Um, I guess, you know, like iterate and then iterate it again, iterate again. So we decided three parallel streams of different ideas was the way to go, so we could kill two and go with one if we liked it. 
At the same time, we had our web developers actually working in WebGL to just get the flow and the movement of the particles down so we could kind of use that as a pre-visualization, just utilizing everyone at this thing. Um, there's a few approaches you could take technically with a project like this within Unreal Engine. Um, we did decide to go with Unreal Engine, even though we knew that the particle system uh, didn't quite have the smarts to do what we needed. Um, but we wanted to work in that development environment for its post-processing and its other development kind of things. It's just as a platform. You could use sort of GPU particles or some sort of like quad chain, like UNSW, essentially a point cloud rendering kind of thing. But that wouldn't have really given us the control we needed um, and the idea of them being individually triggered by users. Um, so instead, oh, there's some nice GIFs. Thank you, Nikki, for making them. Uh, instead, we ended up using instant static meshes and doing all the pathing and logic on the CPU. Now, a lot of you were probably thinking, if you're doing lots of things on the screen and they're all moving, CPU is probably not the best way to go. Uh, but it kind of worked. For those who don't know, instant static meshes are essentially a mesh that shares a draw call with a bunch of clones of itself. Um, so you can have a lot of objects on screen at once, but they all have their own separate transform. So we did a whole bunch of optimizations and threading to get it to work with over half a million individual moving objects. And it might sound like the worst way to do it, but within eight days, it let us do what we needed. And we were really lucky that instant static meshes are so efficient within Unreal. Uh, our biggest cost ended up being the parthing cost calculations because we had these like crazy, insane Fibonacci spirals that um, activated when each like star was triggered to go to its mesh. Um, and obviously, you know, these stack at half a million. If someone ran past and got them all at once, then it would have to like join that big tick list and, you know, we had to optimize that. So at this point in time, I'd like to say none of us had ever done a project like this and it was eight days we had to do it. I had just been hired as full-time at S1T2. The real-time team had just gotten that na its name. It didn't really exist. Or there wasn't a name. Maybe we didn't have a team. Um, <clears throat> but that's what was so cool about this project. We learned so much in eight days and ultimately came, that came back to help us become better designers, uh, art directors, and definitely better at rendering. This project was a long time ago, so I'm glad to see that we've come a long way since then as Liam, the tech wizard, is about to attest to with the next case study. Cool. So Adobe. Um, earlier this year, Adobe hit us up with one of the most open creative briefs we've ever received. Hey, S1T2, can you remix our logo? So I've been following their remix initiative for a while, and some of my favorite artists have participated. Basically, for you guys that don't know, uh, it's an initiative where they give you full creative license over creating a version of their logo which will then be seeded out to all of their social channels. We were the first Australians to be offered this opportunity, and our one requirement was that it was gonna be shown at the opening of the Adobe Marketing Symposium at the Sydney Opera House. With the leaps and bounds in artificial intelligence being brought to the forefront of the technology conversation, we thought this would be the perfect opportunity to explore the relationship between art, artists and their uh, increasingly intelligent tools. With this in mind, we decided we'd, we'd use real-time technologies to bring our artwork to life, uh, as they are our medium and are constantly becoming more and more intelligent. We enlisted the help of an incredibly talented composer and an equally as graceful choreographer to help us piece together a live performance where we would visualize this relationship in real time. Using live MIDI signals from a piano and a real-time mocap suit, we would use this data to generate a graceful and elegant particle simulation that would reflect the journey of an artist discovering their tools and then using those tools to create something inspiring. So I've got a long video here and I'm just gonna skip through most of it. <laughs> Where's the mouse? Yeah, up a bit, cool. you're good. Is that thing? get the idea, hopefully. Right. 
So we ended up taking a little too long with our pre-production process, um, which left us with just over four weeks to create the whole experience. Armed with a giant Pinterest board and some early pre-visuals, pre uh, it was my job to choose the tool um, for us to create what we had in mind, because Jack was too busy eating duck in France. In any other circumstance, I probably would have used Unreal, but we're still waiting on Epic to push Niagara. Chris? <laughs> <laughs> so I decided to go down another uh, more technically ridiculous route, and I thought we'd make our own particle system using some good old raw OpenGL and C++. I had a team of three other people working with me, uh, and none of us knew OpenGL, and one of them didn't even know C++. I kind of figured the looming time pressure just wasn't enough stress. We're all suckers for pain, so we dove, drove, dove headfirst into this project. It was a really, really great way for us to learn new things and also like, jam creatively and get to explore our creative ideas together. We picked up OpenGL in no time, and after the first week, we had a particle system sandbox where we could then start tweaking and creating stuff in. We ended up creating two different main particle systems. Um, the first one consisted of 2.1 million traditional particles, which kind of ebbed and flowed uh, around the dancer as she made her way around the stage. The other was a system that would sample those particles uh, over a certain amount of frames and then would draw geometry based on the velocity of those particles. So you could kind of, um, they would leave these subtle trails of the particles' responses to the dancer's movements. The particle systems we ended up making were actually kind of complex. They would pass through curl noise to give them this really tasty looking nonlinear movement. They had multiple ways of interacting with the dancer and they would change color based on their proximity to her and the intensity of the music. So what we had done was make a generative artwork that would respond to these two amazing performers in real time. We got to collaborate with these very talented artists and show this work in a very public forum at the Sydney Opera House, no less. This cemented the idea for me and my team that we're no longer just developers, we're artists. We were given the opportunity and the affordance to create a stunning visual artwork that told a story while simultaneously being a reimagining uh, re of Adobe's logo. Jack. Strange HCIs. Do you guys know what I'm talking about when I say HCIs? It's basically human uh, control interfaces, things like input methods, so like a mouse and keyboard, but when I say strange HCIs, it's kind of bizarre things to interact with things in strange ways. So one of the coolest things about working in this space is we can control the hardware. We know exactly what we're rolling out on. I know, don't be jealous, it's such a good perk. Uh, all of a sudden, all that cool NVIDIA stuff, like uh, NVIDIA Flex or Gameworks, uh, we can use that if we want uh, really easily. Uh, and we do all the time. In fact, Liam's deploying a project later today, straight after this talk, uh, for, you, for HSBC. Yeah, yeah, that one's going well. Uh, <laughs> you know, we, we, we use this stuff and it's really, really fun. But it's not only that, obviously optimization and performance becomes a lot easier when you know you're shipping to a beefy water-cooled i7 with a 1080 card in it. Um, but that's really just the little stuff. That's not the exciting stuff at all. The biggest, most exciting thing is custom human control interfaces. Because we're able to build our own installations, it means that we can get some pretty unique, strange input devices. In fact, no two projects we ever do are the same, and it really keeps you on your toes in terms of design. You may have already noticed that a lot of our projects that we've spoken about uh, incorporate some sort of like human body movement, uh, or movement in some way. We either use like connects or body suits or motion capture, um, OptiTrack. The, the fact is, is not being tied to a mouse, keyboard, or controller setup is amazing in terms of design diversity. Uh, and I think anyone who's working with VR and motion controllers uh, would attest to that. All of a sudden, there are infinite possibilities that have never been thought about or solved. And whilst it's really challenging and often hardware will let you down, it is incredibly rewarding to see that you've not only developed a new game, but you have redefined the rules of engagement. So my, uh, my favorite project in this respect is a project we did for Westfields and Energizer Batteries. Uh, let's have a quick look at that. I'm in all the videos that I'm showing. I don't want that.
This guy loves it. <laughs> there he is. <laughs> so that's the gist. Um, okay. So, it's Christmas time. Energizer's worked out one very clever little thing. Everyone's buying toys for their kids, and what's something all these toys have in the contemporary age? They all use batteries. Uh, so, you know, they work out how do you engage people in shopping centres when they're doing their Christmas shopping, and that's kind of our mark. We're like hiding in the bushes and we just go jump out and we're like, we're gonna make you a game! And that's kind of how that works. Um, so, we did a project using a giant LED floor, as you can see here, and this thing was really impressive. Uh, we bought it in chunks from China and it took us about like four to eight days to wire the thing, mostly because the documentation was in Chinese and even our Chinese speaking friends could not make any sense of it. Um, the screens were incredible though. They could hold the weight of a car and they were bright enough to light a room easily. Uh, we used a connect to track the feet uh, of the player, thus allowing the player to kind of interact with the giant screen through like stomping and jumping. Uh, and the whole thing was displayed inside this like Santa's sleigh thing, so it was all a nice little package. The game itself kind of played with the intensity of Dance Dance Revolution, but the main difference was that instead of having a very controlled space, it was a four by three meter screen that you're running out on. So it really tied you out. It was super fun to design for this thing because nothing like it really existed. Of course it didn't, this thing was obscene. In any other situation, it would have never made sense. In fact, the only place where you might see this something like this is an arcade. And even then, the power that it would run would never be profitable. And even the initial hardware cost, it just would never make sense. It's impractical. It's crazy that this stuff exists. Um, but that's the thing. Like Within this context, within the enterprise context, it was able to live and have a life of its own. And the abstract nature of this thing really lent itself to really interesting design as well. So. When we were doing this project, every Friday night we would get drunk and Liam would destroy us all getting the high score. Um, and we would just sit there and iterate ideas. What could we add to this game that could make it more fun? How do you use feet for game dev? And that's not something anyone had thought about that much. Um, so that was kind of fun. Um, you know, and, and we'd come up with ideas while we're drinking beers and then you know, with Unreal we could test them in like 30 minutes, see if they were any fun and then try something else. Uh, my favorite was the ability to fire like rockets out of your feet, because it was kind of like, you know, like uh, those boots with the little knives that come out. It was like that, but plus one. <laughs> and you were just like dancing around, Irish dancing and just destroying things. It was great, it was great. Uh, anyway, uh, I guess my point with all that is that we could do no wrong with this HCI. The HCI that we had crafted was so fun because you're running around this four, four by three screen that nothing we could do could make that a bad experience and it was a lot of fun. So the project rolled out to six shopping centers and it was a major success. We had kids lining up for 30 minutes and when they were done, they would um, wrap back around um, while very patient parents like watched on or the parents bailed and treated it like daycare, which was not optimal. Um, I had never made an arcade game before and I'm not sure how many people actually get that opportunity. Uh, what it amazes me is that these strange opportunities exist out there and there's brands that really want to get behind this stuff and the opportunities are out there. It's worth noting that a client comes to us with a problem, like we want to sell batteries in shopping centers, and then we applied that brief to what they want to do. So uh, the way this thing worked was um, S1T2 wanted to do something at scale to experiment with. So we pitched this crazy HCI along with a bunch of equally insane other HCIs, so we made sure we we're doing something crazy. And the client absolutely loved it. Um, but it's worth noting the big part of the talk that we're not talking about and trying to avoid is that you also need really good people doing business development to maintain those uh, relationships, obviously, and um, build that. An idea is not enough for this to go through. But that's, that's not really our field. <laughs> so the next project we did involving HCIs was with Disney. Um, innovating new ways to control our games and projects is something we always try and do. So no one experience should ever behave the exact same way. We enjoy figuring out new and exciting ways for people to interact with the machine. Whether that be on websites, phone apps, games, in VR, or even lighting installations. A lot of the work we do gives us the time affordance to really tweak and play with the way that users interact with our products. 
at the end of the, end of the day, we may only have six weeks to create an experience, but it's an experience that's going to be rolled out and real people are going to be using for months on end. So we take this part of the, the project very seriously. When we were approached by Disney to, to make this experience, we decided we really needed to nail the human interaction component of this project. So I spent my whole time, uh, probably about two months, just working on, on that. The idea of the project was it was going to be an interactive version of the fireworks display that they have over the um, Disneyland castle in Shanghai. And it would be permanently installed in one of their stores at an airport in China somewhere. So other video time. I would say the, the biggest um, thing is really about the experience in the store. What you're going to find is a demonstration of the creativity and the uh, innovation, the sense of innovation of Disney in general, and a big you know, interactive game based on the castle and fireworks that the kids and the families will be able to enjoy. So it's really more than shopping, it's really an experience. So this project was pretty insane. Like, not only was it um, the most like ridiculous opportunity we've ever been presented with, like making something for Disney, getting to use their amazing IP, something we've all dreamt about since we were kids, but the technical re requirements were pretty massive. Also, we couldn't let the ball drop. We had to prove to ourselves and to our client that we're on Disney's level of polish. So we had to go above and beyond. Uh, we, we learned a lot of stuff after doing Energizer uh, with the Kinect and sort of moving around a space doesn't work all the time. Like, I'd say it probably worked about 70% of the time. It's, it depends on who. Yeah, <laughs> that's fair. So we knew that using a Kinect for this experience, we really had to nail the way that it worked so it would work for everyone because you've got little kids uh, trying to play it and you, know, you can't have kids not being able to play a Disney experience. The thing with HCIs is it involves constant playtesting of people of all shapes and sizes. It's really easy to make some small bad choices that will ultimately end up in a really bad user experience. So we did decide to, decide to use the Kinect for this um, purely because it's quite adept at dealing with various environmental problems like lighting changes and all that kind of jazz. And because we could never go to where it was being rolled out, that's something that was really important. To make sure this experience was intuitive enough, um, we really had to come up with a succinct way for the users to see uh, how they're interacting with the experience. We ended up using um, these little Tinkerbell sparkle type things that you can see on the slide that would then follow your hands around on screen. For the interaction, we tried to grab the real world 3D coordinates of the user's hands, so their actual hands where they were in real space and not in the game, and then try and map that to the screen. However, when you're doing this, you're going to run into this strange problem of perception where you're trying to merge these 3D points onto a 2D screen and it just feels really uncom uncomfortable. It was the opposite of how Galileo must have felt. To fix this weird problem, we decided to try and get the hands positions in camera space, so how the camera is seeing your hands, and scale that movement to the screen. And it worked exactly how we wanted because it was 2D to 2D sort of transference. And it, it seemed really intuitive. However, we did find that little people were having a lot of trouble reaching the top of the screen because they couldn't touch that area in camera space. And tall people were having the opposite problem. They couldn't touch the bottom of the screen. So with a little creativity and not too much hacking, we scaled the user's interaction on screen based on how long their spine was. So now little people could use the experience and so could tall people like myself. Here you can see how we went from zero to hero in a few weeks of iteration and playtesting. Making a HCI doesn't have to be super crazy. I mean, what we were doing isn't technically hard or new, but it really changed the way that people interacted with our game and ultimately changed the way they perceived what we made as fun and exciting. So if you're interested in new and exciting ways for people to interact with your stuff, I really suggest getting a connect first. There's also lots of meetups and groups where you can explore HCIs, like Alt Control, and I implore you guys to check this out. 
So, what about your own game ideas if you're working for enterprise? What about that? What about that voice in the back of your head? One of the really cool things about working across all these projects is it is not mutually exclusive with making your own games. The collaboration work we do does not only provide us a constant stream of financial backing to all pay our Sydney rent, but also provides us with many insights into design and tools constantly. To explain this, we can all relate, hopefully, to how much you learn at a game jam. You learn tools, you learn team skills, you learn design knowledge, all from this compressed time period. And in a way, the projects that we do with the compressed time could really be seen as game jams, just without the smell. In a standard game pipeline, you will develop one style or one way of thinking and really push it as far as it can possibly go to make the best product you can. But there's a lot of value in doing lots of smaller projects and uh, that approach from completely new ways of thinking and uh, new unique ways of execution. And whilst we always find the correct technology for the platform, for the client, uh, or uh, for the client's problem, we certainly frame that discussion around the things that we want to develop internally and this is really awesome for the client because it means that they're always going to get something new, but it's incredible for us because it keeps us iterating on new knowledge, ultimately making us become better, better developers. Um, so with all these learnings from all the projects you've seen, we, they were the basic foundation for some IP that we're working on, um, Kept. Uh, so last year we decided to make a VR game, it's called Kept, and it's a game steeped in magic realism where it plays out in a mysterious forest and you interact with strange rituals and jump down a big hole. It's uh, very exciting. Uh, we made a 10 minute vertical slice and showed it off at PAX in 2016, which means that it's almost Kept's first birthday. In a way, Kept is the culmination of all of our experience and time working on these other projects. All the R&D that went into Kept to achieve its high quality rendering came from experience that we garnered from working on clients' VR projects. All the UX and mechanics we borrowed from other projects that we had done for client. Um, as well, because we're always rapidly prototyping and iterating with these clients, we have a wealth of knowledge that we can just take and plop down into any game. And it's very diverse kind of knowledge because we never know what kind of projects we're going to be working on. Basically, I guess what it means above all else is it means that the culmination of success and failures is done on someone else's budget, which is a pretty incredible thing if you're a small studio. Um, William Wallace is back <laughs> to send us off. This is our last slide. He's, cheering this <laughs> He's happy. Uh, the best thing about working in this field is that because you're constantly engaging with new lenses and new problems, learning about strange industries you've never heard of or people who have totally different um, experience sets than you is that you have to get very fast at rapid ideation. All the compromises that you must make will ultimately mean you will find new ways to solve problems. You have to. And I assure you, if you work in this space, you will never be allowed to be comfortable. You will never have such a thing as a comfort zone. If you work in this space, even for a year, it will help you be a better designer, artist, or programmer. I guess the overall takeaway with all this is it's okay to think more than the game that you have always wanted to make. It will always be there for you after all. You are more than a game dev. Your ideas for games and technology can have a much larger impact than entertainment alone. The entertainment industry does not define your future. It's merely one avenue that you can walk down in a truly multifaceted, exciting career. These case studies prove that these projects are cool and exciting. It's not Candy Crush clones or banking apps. Real truth of fact is there is so much room here to be creative and really use our tools that we know so well to achieve incredible potential. Working with other industries will not only give you a broader understanding of the world, but by but applying your skills to new, strange and diverse problems can only help you develop as a game dev. So, next time you're on a lone stretch of road and your car tire explodes and you stand there alone without knowing what to do, look at that broken tire and think, how can game dev help me in this problem? Thank you very much. <laughs>
think I think we're I don't think I think we yeah we don't have any time for questions, but we're around. It's G yeah. it's not too big.